Good evening and thank you for joining us on Krem 2 News at 6 tonight. I'm Mark Hanrahan. We are embarking on week number two of social distancing here at Krem 2, where I'll be anchoring from my home for the time being. Whitney, meantime, is up at the studio. Whitney, I gotta say, it's kind of strange never seeing any of you guys and never really leaving my house other than just for some fresh air from time to time. Yeah, it's definitely weird. The whole communication thing is really weird. I mean, I know we're working out most of the kinks, but um, yeah, it's weird having no one in the newsroom, no one to talk to, no one to tell dad jokes. Uh, we miss that part of you, Mark. <laughs> we have a lot to get to tonight, though, so we're going to get to the top headlines right now. We'll check back with Mark here in just a moment. Uh, one of the top headlines at this hour, both the donation collection and drive through COVID testing sites at the Spokane Interstate Fairgrounds closed today because of strong winds and safety issues. Similar weather on Tuesday might also impact those operational hours for further days as well. We'll keep you posted on that tomorrow. Here is what we know right now about the coronavirus numbers locally so far. Right now there are 50 confirmed cases in uh, Grant County. Two Samaritan Healthcare employees in Moses Lake have now tested positive for COVID-19. The Grant County Healthcare District confirmed both of those employees are now recovering at home in isolation. Meanwhile, the Spokane Health Regional Health District is reporting 136 people have been diagnosed with coronavirus. So far, 22 patients have been hospitalized. Four people have died. Across the state of Washington, now almost 4,900 confirmed cases, 2,000 in King County alone. Statewide, Washington now reporting 195 deaths. Across the state line in Idaho, the death toll rose now to seven today. 30 cases just in the Idaho Panhandle area. Kootenai County now has a total of 29 cases. Also, Bonner County now has its first case. Total, there are 415 cases across Idaho. In the meantime, new this evening, Governor Jay Inslee addressed the state on Washington's response to coronavirus today. Our Regina on is in the newsroom right now and Regina, the governor also joined remotely by several regional authorities, including Spokane's police chief Craig Meidel. So what do we know about how these local authorities are getting involved now? Well, Whitney, Governor Inslee announced a new website for people to report businesses that are in violation of that stay at home order. Here's what it looks like. You can also text report to five zero nine four four eight two thousand and we'll send you this the governor wants people to report businesses that are out of compliance he also stressed that non-essential businesses need to close their doors as we continue to practice social distancing the governor also mentioning three tiers that law enforcement will take if these businesses stay out of compliance the first tier is a warning they'll be reminded of that stay-at-home order but if businesses don't comply the governor says they may get, may get citations suspended pension notices and if it's really bad their businesses licenses may be revoked and if all of that doesn't work there may be a need for civil and criminal proceedings Spokane Police Chief Craig Meidel also chimed in and explained more our officers are working 24 hours a day seven days a week to keep our community safe we're focusing on businesses both closed and open to provide a reassuring presence and to deter criminal activity Governor Inslee also talked about the lack of test kits here in the state. He said the state has been seeing about a two to three times increase in the number of positive cases. In a stern message, the governor said the cases are rising and we're going to see the spread that happened in Seattle happen in other parts of the state as well. Listen, we think over time our hospital system is going to be stretched all across the state of Washington because that wave right now is closest uh, to the Puget Sound core, but it's headed to Spokane. Attorney General Bob Ferguson also addressed the state. He reiterated the 30 day statewide moratorium on evictions. Ferguson stressed that landlords should not be evicting tenants if they can't pay rent. Live in the newsroom, Regina on Krem 2 News. Regina, thank you very much. The temporary shelter at the downtown Spokane Library opened today. It's expected to serve about 100 people while also accommodating social distancing. Crime 2's Amanda Rowley shares the difference this is making for vulnerable populations here in Spokane. The Main Street entrance to the downtown Spokane Library is giving access to Jules Helping Hands, which is one of the two organizations that are operating at the temporary shelter. We talked to Julie Garcia, who is one of the co-founders of Jules Helping Hands. She says they are grateful for this expansion. Doors to the temporary shelter open today at 3. 
Jules Helping Hands will be able to serve about 70 men who will access the shelter from this entrance. Hope House will serve about 80 women who will access that area of the library from the north side. It's amazing. We couldn't thank the city more. We couldn't thank the mayor more for allowing us to use this space. Garcia says before today, some people at the Cannon Street Center have been living in tents Jules provided. That's why she says the library will be a nice change. They're excited to move over to here. We have um, the 50 that will still be staying at Cannon. Garcia and staff spent today bringing in mats and marking spaces to remain six feet apart. Then tonight, Jules will provide their patrons dinner. Both organizations running the temporary shelter will follow directives from the health department, ensuring staff and patrons are properly sanitized. Washing your hands when you're coming in and out of the building, everybody standing with their arms at least spread apart from each other. This is something huge and that they truly have been learning. It's very exciting for us. I mean, it's a way bigger space than we have now, so people will be able to be distanced a little bit farther. Garcia adds they are still handing out tents to those who need them at the Cannon Street Center. Amanda Rowley, Krem 2 News. We're going to switch gears here for a moment. Tom Sherry is back at home as he monitors the forecast. It was kind of a busy day for you. I know, Tom, lots to keep track of. Oh my gosh, we had uh, hail, we had, uh, you know, obviously a cool day, uh, some grapple in certain areas, some rain, and of course, very strong, gusty winds. And we still have a wind advisory that is in effect until 8 o'clock, not for Spokane, but to the south of us. Most of the Washington and Idaho Palouse, the everywhere you see kind of shaded in that tan color, that's that wind advisory again until 8 o'clock tonight. And then those other uh, areas that are shaded in blue, uh, that's a winter weather advisory. You can see it in the Cascade. That's through 11 o'clock tomorrow morning. Also winter weather advisory through portions of eastern Kootenai County as well as into Shoshone County. So if you're going to be on the road tonight traveling late and overnight, especially in the higher elevations, you're going to see some snow showers in those locations. Winds uh, right now have calmed down in the Sandpoint area. We're at 18 mile an hour winds here in Spokane, 20 down in the Pullman area. So the radar is looking less and less wet. As you can see, we've got some showers just to the south of the Spokane area, uh, and it looks like it's trying to edge farther north and out towards the Spokane Valley and also some showers down in southeastern Washington. Here's get a closer view of that. Again, there's some of that rain it has just now begun to move into uh, looks like a little bit south of the freeway and just a little bit west of downtown. So count on more rain moving in here on the South Hill. I'm looking outside. And we've got some rain that is falling. So South Hill getting that rain. 44 degrees, wind is out of the southwest at 18 miles an hour. Day planner forecast calling for an overnight low of 32. And I think we're going to see snow overnight and tomorrow, maybe up to an inch of snow in Spokane, then giving way to afternoon showers and a high of 49. I don't care if we're going through this coronavirus and not, I'm always going to look forward to the weekend. And for the weekend, we've got highs in the low 50s, mostly cloudy skies with a slight chance of showers both Saturday and Sunday. And since this is the six o'clock broadcast, that means it's bonus time. That means you get a 10 day outlook and that's coming up for you in just about eight minutes. In the meantime, we send it over to the truly remarkable, always on time, super handsome, I'm told by the ladies, Mark Hanrahan. Thank you, Tom. New tonight, all Washington Department of Licensing offices will temporarily close starting tomorrow. That means you, all those appointments are canceled at this time and you can't make any future appointments right now either. But most Washington residents are now eligible to renew their licenses online. For a link to renew online, just head to our website. That's creme.com. Also this afternoon, a big announcement from the NCAA. They say they'll be granting an extra year of eligibility to all Division I spring sports athletes. Let's get to Sports Director Brenna Green in the studio right now. And Brenna, you're going to break down just how big of a deal this is. Yeah, so before we get into what exactly this means for spring sports, just want to say that winter sports were not granted an extra year of eligibility. That means seniors like Killy and Tilly will not be able to come back and play for the Bulldogs next season. Okay, back to spring sports. This waiver from the NCAA means that all spring sports players can be granted another year of eligibility should they elect to take it. However, money becomes the next question. The NCAA said that member institutions can match the same amount of money given to scholarship players this season next year 
year, but they also can elect to not match that amount of money. That flexibility applies only to student athletes who would have exhausted their eligibility this season, so basically seniors. The NCAA said in a press release schools can also use the NCAA student assistance fund to help pay for scholarships. Basically, this is just the tip of the iceberg in terms of how this all will play out. Schools now have to decide if they have the means financially to honor extra scholarships next year. If they don't, this could all get pretty interesting. Mark.